Coming to work at Catherine West as a new doctor or nurse is an exciting challenge. Before you start, there are a few important lessons we'd like to pass on to ensure your experience working in an Aboriginal community is a positive and rewarding time for both you and the community you'll be working with. This is Bulla, a community roughly 55 kilometres from the small town of Timber Creek and around 660 kilometres southwest of Darwin. Bulla is like many communities in the Northern Territory. It is small and isolated, and for someone who hasn't been on a community, very different to what you may have experienced. No stoplights, red lights, no taxis. Everything's walking distance. You know, you can walk down the river, have a swim. If it's not, just make sure you ask the locals first. <laughs> where you're going swimming. But that fresh air, you know, you don't get fresh air in, in built up areas and just that freedom. Remote community life is often a new experience to many and as a visitor coming to work in a community, it's important that we all remember some guidelines. When you first go into a community, it is really important to sit back and listen and learn. Ask questions, ask them gently, politely and quietly. You've got to form a relationship with the community, working well with the community, understand, listen, you know, and try and absorb everything and work in with that. Not at your pace, because <laughs> indigenous and communities are different. As a Karia or white fella, you come into work in the communities, you we our baggage is of um, if you can call it baggage, in white society it's about what you have an expectation. You've had a good upbringing, you may have had good food on the table, you've put out a reasonable education, um, you would have had a quality of life. When you come to work in the communities, you actually have to suspend all of that. That's really hard because it's impossible for us Kadia to come into a community without thinking, we've got something to offer Aboriginal people, we can change it and make it better for them. Checking that at the door is the hardest part. But if you get on well with the community and blend in, that's good. You, you'll soon know that you, you're blending because one thing is with Aboriginal people, they, they won't tell you when you're doing something good, I suppose. When you're doing a marvellous job, they, yeah, they, they won't. But as soon as you step out of line, they let you know it. You've got to get into that pace of community life. You know, there's no times, you know, there's no appointments. That's what you gotta realize, no appointments. There's, and it's all relaxed. And it, everything just go out and on due course, you know. Everything will just come to you. Remote health service clinics can be challenging workplaces. Like any new job or working environment, you need to walk before you can run. If you make a mistake, move on, and in time, trust, respect and friendships are developed. For years, Aboriginal people have watched um, non-Aboriginal people coming in and out of their community. So Aboriginal people now um, will sit down, wait and watch you to see whether it's worthwhile for them to invest their time and their energy into that two-way learning process with you. Then you can start talking about lifestyle diseases, changes you need to, that you need to talk about with Aboriginal people. Once you arrive in a community and begin to work in a clinic, there are a number of key aspects that you might not have considered when working with Indigenous people. I thought, hey, you know, I've, got, I've, I've come here, I've got something to offer this mob, I'm gonna I reckon I could change this community. I reckon I'm, I'm a pretty smart guy with a big education. And uh, I had that taken, took a little while to get that out of me, minimally the first 12 months. I've had nobody talk to me for the first 12 months. That, I thought, hey, why doesn't people actually talk to you? Um, and after 12 months and um, these meetings and running issues and people started talking at meetings and saying things to me, I thought, hey, well, it's changed again. What's happening here? Good morning. How are you doing? Developing a relationship is the first thing that needs to happen. You need to take time to develop that relationship. And the way you develop a relationship is being 
somebody that's non-judgmental, somebody who's respectful, somebody who talks respectfully to people. That's the thing that's going to help you develop them relationships. That's why some other people in health management outside of Aboriginal health will say, well, why do you spend so much time talking? It's for that very reason, so that we're always building relationship. You build up that relationship with certain clients or patients, you know, then you got your mate, then you got your mate there to talk to other community members and say, look, you need to come for these checkups or, you know, or even just have a yarn, you know. The relationships are about mutual respect. It's stuff that is already well planted in, in you when you come to communities and relaxing and respecting the people around you is really important. So, have you got a soft throat? Yeah. Being in a place you really don't know and having to drop your own knowledge system, I think that was the biggest challenge. Uh, you know, things don't come on a piece of paper don't work on a computer, they work off if you can't build a relationship, you don't progress. This nurse was just hammering this person there and I said no. I took her away and said look, you're going, on, you're going on about the wrong way, you know. You need to wait, you know. Do you, do you blood pressure, do your BSL, and get that person to um, respond on why they're really there, you know. They might have a sore toe, or might be, you know, they're getting the flu, or you got to give the person time to respond. When that nurse went back and done that consult, and I was just sitting there, you know, one side, and she she made mates with that person then, afterwards, you know, and she found out why the full extent of that um, um, illness that you come in there for. <laughs> I see with that non-indigenous people is that they push indigenous people you know, to make a decision. So like a, you know that you've got a condition that's called hypertension. They've got to understand that it takes any question. You've got to sort of over and over, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? If you don't, look, call out to somebody that you know, you know, a health worker or somebody. Come here. Can you explain to this person what I'm saying? And then they go, yeah. Sometimes we have a problem with um, understanding English as a second language for, for our people, mainly for the elderly people, and it's very hard for them to understand and to give them the information when a non indigenous staff or, or nurse gives them medicine and and it's very hard to understand what that medicine means. Whether you're explaining a diagnosis, medication instructions, or next appointment details, you should always treat people with respect and make sure that your message is understood. Using a translator, simple terminology, or follow-up checks could all prevent misinterpretations of the information you want to convey.